Welcome back. <clears throat> In this uh, slideshow, we're going to talk about pumps. And we'll begin with types, then we'll look at pump curves, system curves, how to match them, and various aspects of installation, and then minor losses around pumps. So the criteria for pumps are established by the irrigation system. There's a required flow rate and pressure for each zone in the irrigation system. You also want to shoot for the highest efficiency. So in this pump curve chart, and this is what you look at, you look at pages of these in pump catalogs, and then you just pick the best pump, the one that matches your system requirements the closest. And for example, you can see that this pump has 76% efficiency at about 500 gallons per minute and 70 uh, meters of head. And so <clears throat> what you would do is you would just find the pump that has a sweet spot uh, near your desired operating point. And so we'll talk a lot more about that. So there's um, three or four pump types, depending on how you classify them. There are uh, centrifugal pumps where you're adding high pressure and low uh, flow rate. And then at the other extreme, there are propeller flow, flow pumps with high flow rate and low pressure. And in between those are some pumps that are used in wells where they're making an intermediate amount of pressure and flow rate in each pump. And they might add those up together and stack them in a well. So the specific speed is the ratio of flow rate here to pressure. And so based on this equation, propeller uh, pumps have a high flow rate to pressure ratio. So their specific speeds are in the range of 10,000. And centrifugal pumps at the other end have a low flow rate to pressure ratio. So their specific speeds are in the range of 500. And this is based on Q in liters per minute and pressure in meters. N is the revolutionary speed of the pump. So how many revolutions per minute? So this is a centrifugal pump. And so it's the opposite of an axial flow pump where an axial flow pump would shoot the water straight through. But in this case, the suction is at the end of the pump and then it turns the direction of the water and it throws the water out towards the volute casing. This is the volute. And then that adds pressure to the water. And then the water flows out um, sideways from the direction that it came in. And this is a centrifugal flow pump with the motor attached. So a motor drives it. Here's the, the suction. It goes into this impeller, which adds pressure by throwing it out towards the outer volute. And then it goes out the discharge. This is a turbine pump. And in the book, it lists it as a um, deep well turbine, but I'm not so sure. It looks like there's a little platform out here. So I think they're just pumping out of this lake or reservoir. But a turbine pump um, has a shaft that goes down and then it turns the bowls. Maybe there's one or two bowls of mixed flow pumps um, in the well. And then it... Um, discharges the water to a pipe that's here, I think, underground. So this pump is being driven by an engine with a PTO shaft. The efficiencies of pumps are, are mainly dependent on the size of the pump. Large pumps, a mixed flow pump, which is the pumps in deep wells, can be up to 90% efficiency, meaning the amount of water horsepower over electrical power going into the pump. 
So you add water horsepower to the water based on the head and the flow rate. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you a simple equation for that. So mixed flow pumps can be up to 90% efficiency, centrifugal pumps up to 85% efficiency, and axial flow pumps where the water's going straight through can be up to the lower 80s. So like I said, um, each pump company provides pump curves for their pumps. And these lines are based on the diameter of the impeller. That's the thing that rotates inside the volute casing. So for example, this impeller diameter is 4.75 inches. This is 5.125 inches. And you can see that each one has a relationship between flow rate and pressure. So in this case, the highest efficiency for this pump is in this range. And if you chose to operate this pump out here at uh, 20 gallons per minute, it would have more like a 50% efficiency. So that's why you have to look through the pump catalog. And I suppose in this case uh, today, they aren't catalogs, they're online uh, curves. And probably the companies, I haven't sized pumps um, in 40 years. So probably at this point, the, you just type in what you need and the pump company just tells you what they have. I'm not sure. But anyway, this is how we used to pick pumps with pump curves. Okay, now a couple other important things are um, each pump has a net positive suction head, which is the distance that the pump can lift the water if the pump is above the water surface. So that's a function of the vapor pressure of water, the fittings, and the, the um, suction pressure that the pump can generate. Also, um, power uh, goes up with um, flow rate in general. Okay, so here's the first, well, actually we skipped a couple examples, but the irrigation system requirement is 600 gallons per minute and 160 feet of head. So if we wanted to find the correct impeller for 600 gallons per minute, we'd go up this line and then we'd go up until we reached 160 feet of head, which looks like it's about here. And so uh, certainly a 12 and 3 eighths impeller would provide that uh, flow rate and pressure. And then if you look over here, we have the different sized motors that can be attached to this pump. And so we're here, we're running up here and we're at uh, 160. So it looks like if we follow this line down, the 30 brake horsepower motor would be sufficient. You always wanna make sure your water horsepower is below your brake horsepower. If you get above the brake horsepower, that burns up the pump because it draws too much electricity through the windings. Okay, so there's a specific relationship between uh, discharge and flow rate and impeller diameter. And so the companies have these standard impeller sizes, but what they can do is, let's say your requirement is in between, like in here, what they can do is they can trim the impellers. So the all of these impellers are all the same. It's just that the outer diameter of the impeller is different. So what they can do for a little bit of extra cost is they can trim the impeller diameter so that um, it fits your exact requirements. So you might decide to buy a cheaper pump and not have exactly the impeller diameter you want or you might decide to spend a little more and pay them to trim the impeller. So the flow rate um, as a function of impeller diameter is linearly related. And the um, head is the square of the impeller diameter. 
And the pressure is the cube of the, or the power, I'm sorry. The power is the cube of the impeller diameter ratio. Okay. So in this case, um, <clears throat> we have a, um, we're going to compare the discharge and head output from the 11 3 8 and 12 and 3 8 inch impellers in figure 9.5 at the optimal efficiency. And so flow rate and pressure are 740 gallons per minute and 122 feet of head with the 11 3 8 impeller and 800 gallons per minute and 145 feet of head with the 12 and 3 8 impeller. So I'll show you that in a minute. So the ratio of the impeller diameters is 1.08. So the head, um, if we compare it to the 11 and 3 8 inch head, which is 122, we multiply that times the ratio squared to get the new head, and that's 144. And if we look at the curve, it's 145. And then the flow rate is just the ratio times the, the um, flow rate and the 11 3 8 and so it's 800 gallons per minute, and that's what we observe at the uh, 12 and 3 8 impeller. So this, in this case, the um, curve confirms the um, diameter. Yeah. So that what we're doing here is we're we're calculating the flow and pressure at the 11 and 3 8 diameter. And then we're seeing if the flow rate here at the 12 and 3 8 diameter agrees with our calculated value, and it does. And so, um, so that's just an academic question, but um, what generally happens is you have to calculate a, an, an impeller diameter for um, and actually, you wouldn't do have to calculate it. You would just tell the pump company, I want this flow rate and pressure, and they would trim the impeller to the right diameter. But in this case, we're going to calculate the impeller diameter based on a total dynamic head of 133 feet. So that's the pressure and a flow rate of 760. So we have the diameter of the 11 and 3 8 impeller times the square root of 133 over 122, and that gives us 11.876. So we would tell the manufacturer to give us that size impeller. OK, so example uh, 9.3, select the appropriate motor in figure 9.5 if the expected flow rate and head are 800 gallons per minute and 145 feet uh, of head, respectively. So <clears throat> now we're focused on the motor. So the 12 and 3 8 impeller matches the speci specified requirements. And the 40 horsepower motor exceeds the 12 and 3 8 impeller curve. Remember I said you can never have more water horsepower than brake horsepower, which is the motor horsepower. So um, now there might be a case like you're flushing the system the at a low pressure where your um, flow rate will exceed the 40 horsepower motor and that would be a problem because you might burn up your 40 horsepower motor and so you'd either want to consult your pump company or your um, um, or, or the farmer that you're selling the system to and tell them the risks or whatever. Sometimes, you know, the farmer does, the farmer would want to spend as little money as possible. And so, you know, it's, sometimes it's a judgment call on that sort of thing. And, uh, but anyway, the basic principle is you don't want to go over the, um, the horsepower with, you don't want the water horsepower to exceed the brake horsepower. Okay, so I said there's an equation for brake horsepower. This is the normal equation used in America where we have um, imperial units. And so after, actually when I was selling irrigation systems, I had this equation in my head. Um, it's gallons per minute times feet of head over 3960 times the efficiency. So for the previous example, 
the um, brake horsepower or horsepower of the motor would be calculated as 800 gallons per minute times 145 feet ahead over 3960 divided by 0.8, which is the efficiency of the pump or 37 horsepower. Okay, uh, now we're going to look at um, an irrigation design that requires 107 cubic meters per hour and total dynamic head of 49 meters. So that's the irrigation system out in the field. But you always have to add pressure for the fittings around the pump. You don't usually consider like the 90s and T's way out, out in the field. That's pretty insignificant. But you have a lot of um, changes in directions around the pump and maybe reductions in diameter and so on. And so, um, Generally, what we would do is we would add 5 PSI, pounds per square inch. So in this case, we're going to say that we're going to add um, 2 meters head loss for all the pump fittings and valves around the pump. And also, pumps degrade over time, so you might want to add extra pressure. So in this case, we're going to add 3 meters pressure to account for degradation of the pump over time. And um, we always had a saying um, at the irrigation company that I worked for, which is no farmer ever complained about having too much water or pressure. Anyway, the required pump discharge pressure is 49, the irrigation requirement, plus two, plus three, or 54 meters. So we're gonna find the operating point. And the pump is a Gould's model 16BZ 3x48, and just, uh, so you know, um, in this um, name, the three the three stands for a three inch discharge diameter, and the four stands for a four inch um, suction diameter or inlet, and the eight stands for eight inch impeller. Okay, so this blue line shows. Um, where the operating point is for the six and three sixteenths inch impeller. And you can see that it's barely over the, um, the impeller diameter. So this, is, this would be a case, especially where you've added three meters of safety factor, and that's put you over the top. But then you might say to the farmer, well, if we didn't have the safety factor, then uh, we would fit within the required impeller diameter. The other significant issue here is that our 25 horsepower motor is below even this impeller diameter. So no matter what we assume, the 24 five horsepower motor is too small. And so what we would do is we'd select the 30 horsepower motor. Well, you might say that that's a waste of energy, but it really isn't. Even if you select the 30 horsepower motor, it's going to draw the amount of power at this point. So even though the impeller diameter curve is up here, it doesn't matter. It's going to draw like 26 horsepower. OK, I already found, I already explained all those things. All right, now. Um, an even more fun thing to do. Actually, I didn't say, but um, picking the pump is the most exciting part of irrigation design. It might not have sounded very exciting, but it's, it's always the funnest part. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, in this case, we have a system curve where the irrigation system flow rate increases with pressure. So we talked about with those uh, sprinkler equations where gallons per minute equals some constant times head to the X. Well, this is that um, equation. And then the pump also has a, a pump curve. So this is representing one of the pump curves I've been showing you. What you can do is you can just plot four points from the pump curve. Like you can just find four points here on this impeller curve and you can plot them in Excel. 
And then you can use Excel to use Trendline in Excel to and use the polynomial and it'll plot the curve and give you an equation for it. So this is our curve of total dynamic head on this axis versus flow rate on this axis. Okay, so that was the pump curve. And then this is the system curve, which resembles the sprinkler curve, which makes sense since the pressure of all the sprinklers goes up and their flow rate goes up. So the Q equals the system coefficient times the total dynamic head to the X. And it might not be exactly the same as the sprinkler X because you also have friction loss in pipes. Okay, so for example, um, the cis 16 BZ pump, which I showed you with seven and one quarter inch impeller is used to run a sprinkler system with this, this system curve. The Q of the system, sprinkler system, is 14.1 times the head of the system. Let's say it's the head at the beginning to the 0.531. And also I mentioned before that you have to account for pressure loss in pump fittings and filters. So in this case, we're going to say that Q system equals a total dynamic head minus four meters, accounting for the, the losses around the pump and in the filters. OK, so now we have a pump curve and we have a system curve and we have to find the intersection point to find the operating point. This is a very important concept, um, possibly not in irrigation system design, but for taking your oral exam for PhDs in water resources. This is a favorite question for some professors. OK, so we have the total dynamic head equals uh, this. And then we can substitute in that for the total dy dynamic head in our system curve. And then by iteration, we can solve for a Q. And so Q equals 118 meters cubed per hour and total dynamic head equals 58 meters. So I provided a spreadsheet. Um, and what it does is you put in your um, some flow and total, total dynamic head points in order to generate this curve. And then it iterates and finds the operating point, the the flow and the uh, meters. So the flow is 117 and the meters of head is 58. So notice here that I've put in the um, A, B, and C coefficients for the pump. And here I have the, um, the system coefficient and the exponent for the system curve. And then um, you can guess a flow rate so again, it's a white cell where you input the information and then it uh, does a few iterations and then calculates, this is the third iteration here, it calculates the uh, flow rate. And then based on the flow rate, it calculates the pressure. Okay, let's move on to a little more complicated situation where we have multiple, and this is common, uh, let's say a farmer has a reservoir and he has four pivots or she and the um, the reservoir uh, so there's a common manifold going to all the pivots from the reservoir so what they do is they would set up four pumps at the reservoir and if they had four pump four pivots running center pivots then they would turn on all four pumps. If they had two pivots running, then they would turn on two pumps. And so um, that's all well and good, but you can see that these four pivots have different amounts of friction loss out to the pivot and they're at different elevations. So it's difficult to size the pumps to match all the pivots. So here's a table and Whenever you design an irrigation system, you generally have to, to size everything for the worst case. For example, your flow rate overall has to supply enough water to match the evaporation or evapotranspiration rate in the middle of the summer. And 
in the case of these pivots and pumps, all the pumps have to have sufficient pressure to supply pivot two. And this is pivot two. Notice that its elevation is 120 meters, which is much higher than these. So even though it's closer to the pump, it's the worst case. So it's on top of a hill. But anyway, uh, this pivot constrains the design of the pumps. So all the pumps would have to supply the pivot flow rate plus the total dynamic head 49.4, which means you wouldn't be wasting much energy supplying these. And by the way, you might have to have uh, pressure reducing valves if you wanted to run them at a certain pressure, but you'd be wasting a lot of energy supplying pivot one. Okay, so um, there's some options with um, variable pressure requirements. One of them is you can get variable speed pumps. Pumps can run at different speeds with different flows and pressure based on speed. So you run it maybe at 3,600 um, RPMs, or you could run it if you had a lower pressure requirement at 2,500 RPMs. So um, anyway, in that way, you wouldn't be wasting energy because uh, when you run it at a lower speed, it takes lower energy. All right, so that's one option, variable speed pumps. If you had an orchard with variable elevations and zone sizes, you could try to have your larger zones at low elevations. So you're kind of matching the pump curve uh, where you're, um, let's see if we can find a curve. Yeah, this one. So maybe your smaller zones and higher elevations would be on this part of the curve and your larger zones and lower elevations would be on this part of the curve. So that's maybe that's why pumps are so fun to design. You have things like issues like this. OK, so that's one option. Another option is variable speed pumps. Another option is a booster pump. Let's say, you know, for like especially orchards, you might have huge in, uh, changes in elevation because farmers like to plant their trees on hills in order to avoid frost uh, problems in the spring. So they like the trees to be up on the hill where it's not going to be down in a valley where it's going to get really cold. Um, anyway, you could use a booster pump. OK, and also um, here's the relationship between speed, RPM, and um, flow rate. So flow rate is directly proportional to the speed of the variable speed pump. Head is proportional to the square of the ratio. And power is, is proportional to the cube of the ratio. OK, so um, in this case, we have a farmer who um, decides to operate his system at half the original pressure and use low pressure sprinkler nozzles. So maybe he ran it at 50 PSI with the high pressure sprinkler nozzles. And now he's going with a hexagon shaped orifice in the nozzle that breaks up the flow and he doesn't need quite as much pressure. So if the original speed was 3,500 of the variable speed motor, uh, if we reduced it to 2,500, then let's see what the uh, flow rate would change, how it would change. So, um, in this case, the Q1 is 260 um, gallons per minute. But if we take the ratio of 2,500 over 3,500, the new flow rate is 186 gallons per minute. And then for the head, we take the square of the ratio times the original head, which is 227 feet. So it would be 116 feet. So you'd you drop the pressure um, quite a bit in that case. OK, and so this um, spreadsheet um, calculates the um, so this um, spreadsheet makes that calculation where it um, first calculates the operating point for the um, non-reduced speed. And then 
it calculates based on the 3500 original RPM and the new RPM 3000. It then calculates uh, new flows and pressures and uh, develops the system flow rate. And then the um, operating point for the reduced speed impeller would be 79 cubic meters per hour and 30 meters of head. I don't know why it's slightly lower than 30 here, but anyway, I'm gonna move on. Okay, and then here's what's really important about the variable speed pump. The power goes from 25 kilowatts to 8.7 kilowatts. So uh, variable speed pumps, although they're more expensive, can save a lot of energy. Okay, let's move on to centrifugal pump installation. And this is also one of the most interesting parts of designing irrigation systems. So we have here a suction and the suction has to be, um, I can't remember if it's 12 inches or 18 inches, but you need to have it sufficiently below the water surface in order to prevent uh, vortexes from coming down and air entering. The worst thing that can happen, well, not, yeah, probably the worst thing is for air to enter into the suction and then that will cause bubbles and bubbles will actually um, pit your impeller. And so you don't wanna create bubbles on the suction side. So um, anyway, what you do is you have a suction and notice that everything's mounted on concrete. And then you have a, like a sweep 90. You don't wanna create turbulence. The most important thing, well, in addition to the air bubbles, is you wanna have laminar flow going into your impeller. It's designed to have laminar flow going into it. Okay, so you go around this sort of sweep 90 and then you go into this um, eccentric. So what you do is you take a cone and you cut it at an angle and you mount it like this. The reason for that is you don't want to build up air bubbles. Like if you had just a cone going down, um, you don't want to have a place to build up air here. So you, you want to have a straight across and you want to have a smooth sort of transition to the diameter of the suction. So remember the pump suction is a given size, but you have a larger size um, suction pipe going down into your reservoir. Okay, so then um, you go into your impeller and then um, in this case, our pump is above our uh, reservoir. So we might have to suck water up into the pump. It's not just gonna draw water when there's air in here. So we might have to use this um, prime, priming valve and a priming pump to actually suck the air out and actually suck the water up into the, um, the impeller. And then we start the pump. You always, if possible, wanna place your pump below the water level so you don't have to worry about this. Because not only do you have to suck the water up into the pump, but you have to worry about the pump losing its prime. So it's much better to have the pump mounted um, below the water level. Well, that might not be possible if the ground surface is significantly above the water level. So in that case, you might just have to have your pump up here. Uh, not, you might think, well, I could dig a pit and put my pump in a pit. The problem with that is the pump might overheat and there might be other problems with it being in a pit. So in uh, in some cases, you do need to put your pump above the reservoir. It's not the end of the world. It just makes it oper operation just a little more complicated. Then you have a pump discharge valve and you always start a pump against a closed discharge valve. Remember we talked about that with respect to water hammer and then you slowly open it and you don't leave the discharge valve closed more than 30 seconds. Otherwise you'll burn up your pump because it's actually a water cooled device. So the water moving through the pump cools it. Okay, and here's the discharge fittings in a little more detail. Um, we have a tapered discharge, not quite as important as the suction being tapered, 
but still um, we're saving energy when we're, whenever we have uh, tapered um, changes in uh, diameter. Here's our priming pump to suck water up into the pump. And then here's our discharge valve. And then there's just here's a little more uh, detail on the suction side with the um, eccentric. And in this case, it says use the long radius L. So generally the irrigation companies will have a shop and they'll weld these types of fittings uh, themselves. Okay, let's talk about net positive suction head. This is very important because it determines the height that a pump can be above the water surface. So I have sort of forgotten how this works, but I'm just gonna try to remember, remember while I'm talking. Okay, so in this case, the pump is three meters above the surface of the pond. There's 0 0.5 meters head loss in the suction pipe and foot valve prior to the pump. The pump flow rate is 1,000 gallons per minute and atmospheric pressure is 9.9 .9 meters. So if atmospheric pressure is 9.9 .9 meters, then our net positive suction head is 9.9 .9 meters minus 0.43 meters for the um, water vapor pressure and minus three meters for the height of the pump above the water and minus 0.5 meters for the losses in the suction pipe and foot valve. So we have six meters of net positive suction head and the net positive suction head requirement for 1000 gallons per minute flow rate in figure 9.5. And I don't think I'm gonna go back there, but remember there was a, a um, some curves at the bottom for the net positive suction head requirement is 2.4 meters. And so the design net positive suction head is six meters is greater than 2.4 meters. So that will not cause cavitation, meaning you won't, you won't create bubbles in the suction side, which would pit the impeller. So our design net positive suction head, six meters, you know, uh, we had atmospheric pressure, then we lost some, um, no, oh, we had three meters required for the, um, or the three meters elevation change, and then uh, water vapor and friction losses. Our net positive section head is six meters, and we only, we only required 2.4 meters, so we're okay. So that means the design of the pump with the pump three meters above the surface is, is okay. That's a very important thing to check. Okay, let's move on from um, centrifugal pumps and let's start a little, spend a little bit of time on well pumps. So this is called a line shaft turbine. And so in this case, we have the drive shaft coming from the engine. So this is common in areas where let's say natural gas or whatever the, the fuel source is for the engine is cheaper than electricity. So in a certain area, you know, electricity might cost 25 cents per kilowatt hour and natural gas is cheap because they're on a natural gas pipeline. And so they'll choose these engines over electric. So anyway, here we have an engine drive shaft. It's got some kind of joint in the um, head here. And then it drives this um, uh, shaft that's inside of the um, pipe that the water's coming up. So the water's coming up inside this pipe. This outer pipe is the well casing. And then the pump shaft is inside the um, pipe with the water coming up. And then this pipe goes down to the bowls that are down um, lower below the water level of the groundwater. Okay, so here's a similar um, situation with pump bowls. But in this case, we have an electric line going down to a motor and the motor is is spinning the the um, impellers inside of the pump bowls and so that's pumping the water up so we have an electric line going down outside the um, discharge pipe and here's the well casing out here so what we have is we have well casing 
we have perforated um, uh, screen or perforated well casing, which allows water to come in from the groundwater, the um, groundwater surrounding the well casing. And then the pump is inside of the well casing. So you have your pump bowls connected to your discharge pipe and that's how the water comes out. So I talked a little bit about cost comparison and I'm not gonna go through this table here, but in this case, we're looking at a comparison of diesel fuel cost. And then we look at the cost of installation of the diesel pump, which includes the motor. Then we look, we look at the electric power cost and we also include the electric pump costs and we compare the two and we can see that the electric pump in this case is cheaper than the total present value of the diesel pump. Okay, so um, I talked a little bit before about adding like five PSI pressure to the, um, the irrigation system requirements in, in order to account for all the pump losses. And so the, those are all these losses here. So we have the suction, the filter, this bend, the impeller cone, whoops, not the impeller cone, but the eccentric cone. Then we have the discharge, maybe a 90 here. We have the cone, we have a gate valve and we're discharging into open uh, canal. So I'm not gonna go through this, but I, um, I talked a little bit before about minor losses. So you have to attach a minor loss coefficient for every um, fitting. So you can see that I start with the suction pipe, then I, I go into the, um, yeah, suction pipe, inlet pipe, outlet pipe, and discharge pipe. So I have all those added up and I'm not gonna go through this either, but it's all in this centrifugal pump fittings um, spreadsheet corresponding with example 9-11. And example 9-12, instead of just discharging to a, um, a, a canal, it pumps it up into a reservoir. And I also have a 9-12 example. So you can look at all the fittings, all the minor loss coefficients and see how they're added up. And you come up with the total um, pump, type, total dynamic head required. And at the top of the spreadsheet, it has the, um, the elevation gain. So in this case, it's just one meter, but in the, in the other example, it would be 20 meters. Okay. Lastly, let's talk about um, chemigation systems. So this is very common that you would have a pumping system to deliver water, but you would also add in chemicals. So that's called chemigation, applying chemicals with irrigation. And um, so in this case, we are using a positive displacement pump to suck water out of a tank and we're um, injecting it into the, um, into the irrigation system. And this, as you can imagine, depending on the chemical you're injecting, and by the way, you have to have registration for all the chemicals you're injecting. Um, and so fertilizer wouldn't have restrictions, but even if you're injecting fertilizer from a tank, you can imagine um, what would happen if you were suddenly injecting fertilizer down into the groundwater, that wouldn't be a good thing. You can also imagine what would happen if you injected pesticide down into the groundwater. You wouldn't be very popular um, and actually you would be violating some laws. Every state has very strict laws on what types of backflow prevention, vacuum breakers, all sorts of things that can go wrong, you know, where water will drain back down in here. And if you're still injecting pesticides, uh, you know, that's bad. So you have a pressure switch to turn off your injection pump. If you lose pressure in the discharge pipe and there's, interlocked control panels where electricians install this so that the pump, the motor is not injecting chemical into the 
um, irrigation system when the water is not flowing out to the field. So like I said, there's very specific laws on um, using these um, types of systems. Okay, and then lastly, I showed you a positive displacement pump. You can also use a Venturi injector where you take water out of the uh, main pipeline, you run it through a Venturi, and because the velocity is high here, the um, pressure is low, and so that's gonna suck um, chemical into the system. This is nice because you don't have any uh, corrosion problems. These are made out of plastic. And so um, you are, uh, is, and it's cheaper, obviously. So a lot of farmers like using them, these Venturi injectors. The problem might be that you're adding quite a bit of pressure to the water, possibly, to get the um, water through the Venturi injector. So anyway, um, you can um, look at the specific calculations involved and decide whether a Venturi injector or a positive displacement pump is more reliable and cheaper and so on. All right, we'll see you next time.